A listener note, this episode contains references to adult content and language and contains material that some might find offensive. It's the morning of February 28th, 1993. Outside Waco, Texas, a sleek pickup truck pulls into a dirt lot. The truck door opens and a man steps out into the cold morning air. A wind whistles lightly and rustles the grass along the prairie. The man's name is Robert Rodriguez. He's 42 with thick, dark hair and a linebacker's physique. He cuts the truck's engine and gazes at an unassuming cluster of wooden buildings known as Mount Carmel Center. Rodriguez knows far more about Mount Carmel than he cares to. He's met many of the men, women, and children who live here, all members of a religious cult called the Branch Davidians. They're more than a hundred strong, and the group is led by a man named David Koresh. Rodriguez knows that Koresh is a high school dropout whose given name is Vernon Howell. But here at Mount Carmel, Koresh is something much more, much bigger. His followers believe that he is the Messiah. As he tells them, he is the new embodiment of Christ here on earth to bring about the end of days. Rodriguez gets out of his truck and walks toward the compound. He hates visiting this place, but he's careful to keep a smile on his broad face. He can't allow anything to reveal his true feelings or his real job. Rodriguez is an undercover agent with the ATF, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and he knows there are buildings full of guns at Mount Carmel. About a month ago, Rodriguez and other ATF agents moved into a house just down the road. They've been posing as students at a local technical school and inventing reasons to visit the neighbors. Koresh always seems glad to have them. He even told Rodriguez he could move in. Rodriguez shudders. The suggestion alone made his skin crawl. But with any luck, today will be the last time he ever has to visit this place. Already, a mile-long convoy of ATF and National Guard troops is on its way from nearby Fort Hood. They're armed for a full-scale assault and prepared to take Koresh into custody. And so today, Rodriguez has one last crucial task. Take a final look around Mount Carmel. If he doesn't see anything that's out of the ordinary, the raid is on. Rodriguez knocks on the door of one of the buildings. He exhales sharply, trying to steady himself. The door opens. Crash himself stands in the doorway. He's thin with curly dark hair and wire-framed glasses. He beams when he sees Rodriguez. Robert! Great to see you. Hi, David. Brought you a copy of that paper. You made the front page again. More lies, I'm sure. Koresh takes the newspaper. Thanks, Robert. Come on in. Rodriguez enters, and the two take their seats next to each other. Rodriguez gets ready for what's sure to be another rambling speech about the Bible. But then they're interrupted. One of Koresh's followers bursts through the door. He spots Rodriguez and then hurries into a back room. A moment later, he calls out to David, saying he's got a phone call. Koresh frowns. Be right there. Sorry, Robert. Just give me a sec. Koresh gets up and leaves the room. He's only gone a couple of minutes. But when he walks back in, his entire demeanor has changed. He's visibly shaking, and Rodriguez has only one thought. Koresh has been tipped off. He knows the raid is coming. Koresh locks eyes on him. They'll never get me, Robert. Rodriguez tries to keep his expression blank. Get you? What do you mean? Koresh moves to the window and opens the blinds. You know what I mean. We know they're coming. Rodriguez is frozen to his seat, but he knows he has to keep his cover. Sorry, who's coming? It's up to you now, Robert. Good luck. Rodriguez stands up. He needs to get out of here and fast. Okay, David. I, I've got to get back to the house, uh guys are cooking breakfast, so. Rodriguez walks back towards his truck as calmly as he can. He's shaking, but trying not to show it. He's sure he's about to be shot in the back. A thought screams through his head. He knows. Koresh knows about the raid. Rodriguez has to hurry and warn the others. They're walking straight into a hornet's nest. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. (music) 
On the morning of February 28, 1993, federal forces arrived on David Koresh's doorstep. A fierce shootout ensued. It was the longest firefight in the history of American law enforcement, and it caused massive bloodshed on both sides. The deadly conflict also raised important questions about the government's use of force, and more broadly, about the limits of civil liberties in America. In the U.S., people are guaranteed the freedom to practice religion. The Constitution also promises that no one will be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. But sometimes these rights can cause strife between Americans and their leaders in government. The standoff at Waco was one of the most dramatic examples of this kind of conflict. To the Branch Davidians, the government raid was unprovoked. It forced a religious community to pay in blood for their constitutionally guaranteed protections. Government agents saw it differently. To them, Koresh was a dangerous cult leader who had brainwashed his followers and violated gun laws. There were also allegations of polygamy, child abuse, and statutory rape. In this six-part series, we'll explore how this standoff and its tragic ending might have been averted. Part of the answer lies with the man who built a devoted following in Waco. He was the self-proclaimed savior who was born Vernon Howe, but became known to the world as David Koresh. This is episode one, The New Messiah. It's mid-August, 1968, in Richardson, Texas. Bonnie Haldeman sits in her station wagon, waiting to pick up her son from his first day of class. He's in the third grade, and his name is Vernon Howell. Haldeman sees the teachers exit the building. They're followed by a neat line of students. Haldeman smiles. It's only the first day, but the teachers already have the kids in order. It's a welcome sight. She's glad they were finally able to move to such a good suburban school district outside Dallas. Haldeman is grateful to have her son, but Vernon sure hasn't been easy. She was only 14 when she had him, and she feels guilty for everything her son has put up with since. It never worked out with Vernon's dad, and she married the next guy pretty quickly. But that didn't work out either. Her new husband had just left prison, and he beat Vernon every time he cried. The boy was just a toddler. got so bad, Vernon had to live with his grandmother. When Haldeman's life got a little more stable, Vernon moved back in with her. But the trouble is, her newest husband doesn't seem to love Vernon either. He's always yelling at the boy, telling him to be a man, and he beats him. Haldeman sees Vernon walking towards her across the schoolyard. His head hangs low. There are no other students around him. Haldeman frowns. He's usually so full of energy and so good at making friends. Vernon opens the car door and she sees that he's been crying. He slumps into the passenger seat and blurts out his terrible discovery. He says he's in a class for kids with intellectual disabilities. Haldeman lays a hand on his shoulder. Vernon sniffles and wipes the snot from his nose. As he stares out the window, Vernon's mom asks him why he would say such a thing, but she already knows the answer. She's finally got him into a special ed class. She just never thought to prepare him for the change. Then Vernon tells her what happened at recess. His class got let out late. They were running to the playground. That's when the other kids started shouting insults at him, making fun of him for being in special ed. Haldeman watches him relive the moment all over again. All the confidence that usually makes him so popular, it seems like it drained out onto the floorboards. She tries to reassure him. He just has a little learning disability, that's all. She sees him frown at the words, so she tries again. You're special, she says. God made you very special. This seems to perk him up a bit. Vernon does love church. It's thanks to his grandma, who started taking him to Seventh-day Adventist services. Vernon thinks for a moment, then gives his mom a little smile. He tells her she's right. Maybe God has a plan for him. It's a warm summer night in a grassy field outside Dallas in 1978, and about 10 years have passed since Vernon Howell was taunted at his elementary school. Tonight, Vernon Howell lies on his back in the bed of his pickup, looking up at the stars, 19 years old, and for months now, he's been living out of his truck. It's better than staying under his mother's roof. That's especially true when his stepfather is drinking. These days, he's been talking a lot to God. Usually, the Lord answers back, but lately, he's been silent. Howell feels lost without God's instructions. What he wants more than anything is to understand God's plan for him. There was a time when he felt he'd found his place in God's kingdom. 
He thought maybe he wasn't so stupid after all. He finally learned to read, and by middle school, he'd memorized the best parts of the Bible. In high school, he even preached to his classmates, but that was before he dropped out to earn some quick cash in the Texas oil boom. Hal discovered that he had a knack for machinery and fixing cars. He also learned how to play guitar. He even fell in love. Linda was the first girl he had ever been with. He was 18, but she was only 16. Hal knew he could get in trouble with the law, but he couldn't resist Linda. So he followed her to her bedroom while her dad was asleep. In a way, it really bothered him, the fact that he couldn't resist her. It only got worse from there. When Linda called and said she was pregnant, he panicked. He lied and said the baby couldn't be his, that he was sterile. The memory causes Hal to wince. And now, as he lies in his truck, the stars overhead start to blur. The Lord told him that Linda had become his spiritual wife, and eventually he asked Linda to marry him. But she told him that she'd had an abortion, and she refused his proposal. Tonight, as he thinks back on that moment, Hal is racked with anguish. He wonders if the Lord will ever forgive him. Suddenly, Hal has the feeling that he's surrounded. He bolts upright in the truck bed, peers into the darkness. No one is out there, but he still feels like he's being watched from every angle. He's had this feeling before, like he's trapped. That was back when he was 12, and a group of older boys pinned him down and sexually assaulted him. This is like that, but it's different, because the voice of God enters Hal's mind. The Lord's presence is always terrifying in its power, but tonight, his message sounds merciful. Vernon, my son, I see you are hurting. You loved her, and now she's turned her back on you. She's rejected you. Howell tries to answer, but he's overwhelmed by pain, which fills his entire body. Vernon, for 19 years I've loved you, and for 19 years you've done little to show your love to me. You've rejected me. Will you never change? Howell feels sick with remorse, but at that moment something begins to shift inside him. The remorse begins to fade, and suddenly Howell knows what he must do. He will never reject God again. He'll follow the Lord's path without wavering, because he cannot afford to lose God the way he lost Linda. You haven't lost her forever, Vernon. Use your gifts to reveal the truths of the Bible. Serve me faithfully, and I'll give her to you. The world rushes back, and the voice of God is gone. Howell is left quaking in the truck bed. He now knows the Lord has big plans for him, and he must devote himself fully. So he jumps out of the truck bed and into the driver's seat. He'll study his Bible by the truck's dome light until the battery fades. It's the summer of 1981. At a rundown truck stop outside Waco, Texas, Vernon Howell finishes topping off his gas tank. He removes the nozzle and walks inside the station. Howell asks the old man behind the counter about a place called Mount Carmel. The man shoots Howell a suspicious look. Why would he want to go out there? Hal just shrugs and smiles, and the old man reluctantly gives him directions. Hal thanks him and heads to the restroom. He stares at his face in the mirror. He's grown a beard, looking a little scraggly. But that's probably what Christ looked like, too, he thinks. At least if you saw Jesus in real life and not in some painting in a stuffy old church. Hal is done with stuffy old churches. Just a few months ago, he was kicked out of the Seventh-day Adventists, the pastor didn't like that Howell was sharing his messages from God. He was talking about the end days, about how a new prophet would open up the seven seals from the book of Revelations. But the last straw was the vision Howell had received from God, showing him that he'd marry the pastor's young daughter. Howell exits the gas station and pulls back onto the highway, and once again he feels ashamed. Yet another of the Lord's marriage plans didn't pan out. He'd spent the past couple of months adrift trying to answer hard questions. Where did his path lead? Why weren't there prophets in the world today? To Hal's amazement, one of his friends said she'd actually heard of a modern-day prophet, an old woman living just a couple hours south of Dallas, a woman that lived in a place called Mount Carmel. That's where Hal is headed now. He looks up at the trees lining the road, the intersecting branches like a crown of thorns. He can hardly believe that in just a few more miles, he will get to meet his first real-life prophet. 
It's less than an hour later, and Howell was 13 miles outside Waco. He's standing at the entrance to Mount Carmel Center. The harsh afternoon light bounces off the simple, white buildings. Already, he admires the humble nature of this place. It was built right in the middle of a quiet prairie. Howell gets out and takes a look around. A group of children play in the fields. A few women watch them. As Howell approaches, a woman with a British accent greets him. She agrees to take him to meet the prophet, whose name is Lois Roden. The woman leads Howell through a labyrinth of buildings, and soon they find the prophet. Lois Roden welcomes Howell with a simple nod. She's a thin, bird-like woman in her late 60s, with oversized glasses and a prominent chin. She offers to take Howell on a tour of the property. Walking together, they pass a series of small houses. Nearby, a young couple lifts buckets of water from the stone well. Roden talks as they walk, and Howell hangs on her every word. He loves her confident voice. She stops and points out an old, weather-beaten church. She explains that this group, the Branch Davidians, started in the 1930s. They moved to this property in the late 50s. Her husband, Ben Roden, was the prophet back then, before he died. Hal asks Roden whether she has any children. A shadow crosses her face. She says she had a son, George, but he wasn't with the community anymore. Just then, a man hurries past, wearing a postman's uniform. Roden explains that many people at Mount Carmel have jobs outside the community. They don't pool their money, but they do live together and share a simple life, and they're bonded by the same goal. Together, they await the coming of a new Christ and the end of days. Hal can join them if he's devoted to their message and if he can manage to live as simply as they do. Hal already knows his answer. All his life, he's been searching for this sort of community. He will join the Branch Davidians, and he will follow Lois Roden. Or at least, that's where he'll start. Because lately, Vernon Howe has been hearing more from God. God has been sharing his plans with Howe, and the plans suggest that Vernon Howe might play a bigger role at Mount Carmel than anyone could ever imagine. It's August 1983 on a drowsy afternoon. Vernon Howell walks confidently among the people of Mount Carmel. He greets the adults and smiles at the children. A group of girls have drawn a game of hopscotch in the prairie dirt. He stops to watch for a moment and then continues on. When Howell first moved here two years ago, he was a nobody. At first, he was assigned to clean dishes in the cafeteria. The community treated him like an errand boy, but Howell was always good at making friends and Mount Carmel was no different. He started fixing people's cars, he helped repair their houses, and slowly began to gain their respect. But the biggest change was in his relationship to the prophet herself. Once Lois Roden took a liking to Hal, he was free of dish duty for good. And now, Hal arrives at Roden's home. He looks over his shoulder to see if anyone's watching. No one is, and Hal feels relieved. Because a few months ago, God told Hal that his relationship with Roden should become more intimate. It would fulfill a biblical prophecy that she, the prophet, would bear a son. He had told Roden about his vision, and she agreed that they had to act on it, but they needed to be discreet. And while Roden is in her late 60s, they're fortunate to have the Lord's favor. Together, they're sure to conceive a righteous son. Hal pushes open the weathered front door without knocking. He finds Roden sitting on her old plaid sofa, but she looks troubled. Hal joins her on the sofa and puts an arm around her. He asks what's bothering her. She says it's her son, George. Hal fights to mask his anger. It's always George. Hal has never met Roden's estranged son, but she's told him plenty. How George wanted to take over Mount Carmel when his father died. How he left, full of rage, when she wouldn't allow him to preach. How George still wants to take Lois's place when she's dead and gone. Hal has a different plan in mind. It's become increasingly clear to him that he should be Roden's successor. He should be the prophet. He's even prepared a series of sermons, but Roden keeps telling him to wait. To how it's obvious why she won't let him preach. She's worried about her son, George. Hal looks into Roden's eyes and smiles. He reminds her that George lives way out in California and doesn't know what's going on in Texas. True, she says, but he'll find out eventually. Once he hears someone else is preaching from the Mount Carmel pulpit, he'll come back and he'll cause trouble. 
George is violent, she tells Hal. He has guns. He'll kill Hal if he finds out they're sharing a bed. Hal promises it won't be that bad. If she would just let him give a few sermons, she'll see. The people need to hear his words. They were given to him by God. Hal can sense that Roden is hesitating, so he pushes harder. He suggests that maybe this is the reason she still isn't pregnant. She's blocking God's will by not allowing him to speak. So why would God allow her, an older woman, to bear a child and fulfill the prophecy? Roden looks at Hal, her features softening. She doesn't say anything, but Hal can tell his words have hit home. He knows she'll relent soon, and then he'll finally get his chance to preach. It's the fall of 1983. Inside the small church at Mount Carmel, Lois Roden waits for Vernon Howe to make his debut as a prophet. She stands at the back of the church and watches as her followers enter and file into the pews. It's strange seeing them gather for someone else's sermons. Usually when the service starts, she feels calm as she awaits God's inspiration. But today, all she feels is anxiousness. Howell's sermon today will set her flock on a whole new course. It's the first public sign that he will be Roden's successor. As the last of her followers arrive, Roden notices the floorboards creak. The church's foundation has been sinking. An aging church to match her aging body, she thinks. And as Howell keeps saying, it's time for fresh blood at Mount Carmel. Roden watches Howell launch into his sermon. He speaks of sin and salvation. But his mix of calm and passion, that's what most inspires her. Howell seems to have complete faith in the truth of his words. At first, her followers look to her, silently asking if it's okay for them to accept his guidance. But soon they're as wrapped up in his message as she is. It's clear as day. God has given Howell a gift. Howell is pacing back and forth now. The energy in the church feels electric. His sermon is gaining force and momentum. Everyone is transfixed by his inspired sermon. But suddenly, a terrible worry begins to gnaw at Roden. What if Hal is a mistake? She didn't have much of a choice. Her son George is no prophet. No one follows him, even if he tries to look strong, strutting about with his pistol. But her flock will follow Vernon Howell. Roden looks around the church. Every member of the congregation is locked in on Howell. Some nod in agreement. Some are visibly moved. Roden thinks, yes, it must be God's plan for Howell to lead them, even if that means risking George's wrath. Roden brings her hands together and prays for peace at Mount Carmel. Just then, Howell pauses in his sermon. He gazes straight at her, and Roden realizes that what she set in motion today can never be reversed. It's 1983, just a few weeks before Christmas. George Roden stands at the Mount Carmel pulpit. His black Stetson hat is tipped back, and a pistol gleams at his hip. At the back of the church, Lois Roden listens, her hands trembling. Just as she feared, George rushed home as soon as he heard about Hal's debut as a prophet. And now he's delivering a hellish sermon to the flock, and the subject of the sermon is Vernon Howell. Lois looks over at her young lover, sitting in the back of the church. Howell gives her a contemptuous look. It's as if George's return is all her fault. George roars from the front of the church, working himself into a frenzy. He's so angry that spit flies from his mouth. He calls Howell a usurper, a devil worshiper. Lois listens in horror, wishing she could just disappear. But George is just getting started. He then accuses Howell of sexually assaulting Lois. Up until now, the people have been sitting stock still. They're too shocked to speak. But this accusation is too much, because over the past few months, Howell has built a strong following. And so when George starts raving about sexual assault, several of Howell's followers stand up and begin shouting him down. Lois looks over to see Howell's reaction. He's still seated, calmly, letting his followers attack George on his behalf. Towards the front, a middle-aged woman loudly denounces George. She calls him a false prophet, but that makes him even more enraged, and he shoves her. The woman trips backwards over a pew and falls to the ground, landing with a thump. There's a gasp in the church, but no one seems willing to come near George, except Vernon Howell. Lois watches as Howell stands up, walks silently to the front of the room, and helps the middle-aged woman up from the floor. Howell leaves the church with her, 
and almost everyone gets up and trails behind them. And as they leave, Lois's flock carefully avoids looking at her. It's an overcast day in January 1984. Lois Roden stands at her bedroom window, staring at the line of cars making a slow exodus from Mount Carmel. Her worst fears have come to pass, and it's happened much more quickly than she could have ever imagined. Earlier today, Vernon Howell told Roden that he and his followers were leaving Mount Carmel. They didn't want to risk open conflict with George, and George had taken to roaming the property with an Uzi submachine gun. When Roden begged Howell to reconsider, he grew angry, and he had said things she couldn't believe were coming from her chosen successor. He said she was no longer a prophet. He accused her of losing her connection to God. He even said that the Lord was punishing her and that this was the reason why she would never bear God's child. But what Hal said next hurt her more than any of the insults. He said that he would soon marry Rachel Jones. This shocked Lois Roden. Rachel is like a granddaughter. She's only 14 and the oldest daughter of one of the families in the community. But her parents gave their consent to the marriage, and that means she will become Howell's spiritual and legal wife. Roden closes the blinds in anguish, and the room is cast into shadow. She can't stand to watch anymore. She's lost the chance for a miracle child. She's lost her successor. Now she's losing her beloved followers. All she has left is her wild son, George, and she can't bear to turn him away. It's January 1985 in Jerusalem, Israel. 15-year-old Rachel Howell, who used to be Rachel Jones, watches as the sunset casts a glow over the pale stone temples of this ancient city. She's seen this sight many times on this trip with her husband, Vernon. It usually leaves her in complete awe. But tonight, she's feeling something else. It's loneliness, the sense that she's a foreigner in a foreign place. She knows she's not crazy. It's been many weeks since she last saw her family. She misses her parents and her sisters most of all. Rachel moves closer to the window and peers down the street, but still no sign of Vernon. He's been gone all day, visiting a place called Mount Zion. It's a special place because she knows that on Mount Zion, she and the other chosen ones will ascend to heaven before the final judgment. Vernon can't say exactly when this will happen, but that's why they came to Israel, so that he could learn more about their place in God's plan. Rachel leaves the window and walks to the bathroom. She's still getting used to all the changes in her body now that she's pregnant. In a lot of ways, it's been a strange year. First, her parents told her about Hal's vision, that she should be his wife and bear his children. She knew Hal was the man who preached for hours about sin, and at first, she was frightened. But her parents said that Hal was inspired by God and that their union would be holy. She accepted their words as truth. Rachel looks in the bathroom mirror and combs her long blonde hair. It's beautiful here in Jerusalem, but she's sick of all this moving around. She married Hal just before he led her family and the rest of his followers out of Mount Carmel. First, they moved to Waco. Then they moved to a smaller, more isolated community. And at last, they settled in the middle of nowhere, way out in the woods near Palestine, Texas. Rachel hated the dirt and the cold of the camp, but at least they were finally safe from George Roden. Just then, Howell bursts through the door. Rachel turns to greet him, but stops when she sees the wild expression on his face. What's wrong? Are you okay? We need to get back to Texas and right away. Rachel's heart leaps. For days, she's been praying to be able to see her sisters again. Are you sure, Vernon? I thought you wanted me to have the baby in Israel. Howell gives her a dismissive look. Everything's changed. You can't understand. Yes, I can. We're together. We're bonded. Howell pauses, and his face softens. Rachel... I've had a vision. I was atop Mount Zion. Seven angels came to me. They were riding fiery horses and had flaming swords. They led me to God. Rachel's eyes widen. The Lord gave me a scroll, said I should eat it. When I did, it gave me perfect knowledge of scripture. Everything the Bible predicts for the end of this earth, it all, it all became clear. Just like that. Hal looks into Rachel's eyes. I am the final Messiah, the final Christ. Our people will be the first to ascend to God's kingdom. Rachel knows that she should be excited, but all she feels is scared. What about our baby, Vernon? Oh, he'll play a part in all of this too, an important part. The end won't come for 10 more years. In 1995, I saw it, I saw it as clear as day. 10 years is a lot of time. 
Rachel wants to cry. She knows the end is a beautiful thing, that it means all the suffering on earth will cease, but there's still so much she wants to do. Will we go home to Mount Carmel before that? Of course, of course. I don't know when yet, but we'll find a way. We'll get back to Mount Carmel, whether George Roden allows it or not. Hal suddenly looks exhausted. He flops down on the bed and stares up at the ceiling. Rachel lies down beside him, waiting. She breathes a sigh of relief when she hears her husband softly snoring. She lies awake, thinking. She smiles at the thought of seeing her parents soon, and eventually seeing her home again. But then she pictures George Roden with all his guns. She worries what will happen when Hal confronts him. The future she wants at Mount Carmel is peaceful, but right now, all she can see is anger and darkness. It's fall in 1987, and a brisk morning at the Davidian camp near Palestine, Texas. Vernon Howell walks among his followers as they tend to their cook fires. Smoke curls up through the pine trees. He spots his wife, Rachel, huddling near one of the fires. She holds their son, Cyrus, at her breast. It's been more than a year since Howell had his vision in Jerusalem, and more than a year since he uncovered that he is the second coming of Christ, as he and his group prepare for the end of times. Despite this revelation, he and his followers are still living in the wilderness. Entire families are packed into old school buses and makeshift log cabins. There's no electricity or running water. There are things Howell likes about this setup. The hardship keeps everyone focused on preparing to meet God. He's grown more confident in his teachings, and now Howell imposes a strict diet on his followers. They must all be pure. Howell looks out at the camp in satisfaction. His army is stronger than ever. But he can't hide it. There's a glaring problem. No matter how loyal his followers are, he knows he won't be the undisputed prophet for all Davidians until he retakes Mount Carmel. And that won't be easy. Lois Roden died, and Hal felt pity for her. Pity that she hadn't accepted his role as the new Christ. But her death also created a problem. Now, George Roden has fully taken control of the property. He's even renamed it Rodenville. There's little chance he'll give it up easily. As Howell continues to survey his camp, a man arrives and asks to speak with him. He says he's one of the few who's still living at Mount Carmel, and he tells Howell some big news. George Roden wants to have a showdown, a way to prove who's the new prophet once and for all. The man explains how this battle will work. George has dug up the body of one of Lois's followers from the Mount Carmel Cemetery. Whichever one of them can bring the woman back from the dead will be the next prophet. Howell laughs at the messenger. He knew George was crazy, but this? He had no idea George was so out of control. He shakes his head and says, no, tell George I'm not in the resurrection business. But as the man leaves the camp, a thought occurs to Howell. George's latest scheme may be crazy, but maybe it's exactly what Howell needs, a way to push the last rival prophet off his perch. It's a few days later inside the McLennan County Sheriff's Office in Waco, Texas. A deputy sits at the reception desk, slowly filling out a crossword puzzle and waiting for a shift to end. The deputy hears the door open, looks up, and sees a small group of men heading toward him. The curly-haired man in front stops at the desk. The others arrange themselves behind him, almost like bodyguards. Can I help, boys? Sheriff, I'm Vernon Howell. Do you remember me? called about the corpse that's being desecrated up at Mount Carmel Center. The deputy sets aside his crossword puzzle. Sir, I told you that's not something I'm going to bother with if you don't have any evidence. Howell reaches into his backpack, pulls out a stack of photos. Oh, I've got the evidence right here. Take a look. He drops the photos on the desk, and the deputy begins flipping through them. They show a coffin draped in a decaying Israeli flag. The coffin sits at the front of what looks like a simple country church. Yeah, I can see that's a coffin. So are you going to go out and arrest George Roden? Well, it, it's a coffin. It's dirty, so I guess it's been in the ground. But, but how do I know there's a body in there? Of course there's a body. It's a woman who's been dead 20 years. Go out there and arrest George Roden. See for yourself. Now, sir, calm down. I've got better things to do than chasing down skeletons. 
I need evidence there's a body. I'm not arresting George Roden or anyone else over nothing. So you want pictures of actual bones. That's, that's what you want. If you have proof that there's a body, yes, I'll go out and look into it. Otherwise, just leave me out of this dispute, okay? It seems to me like you want us to do your job for you, deputy. Now, it seems to me like you boys had better watch yourselves. It's a tough crowd over at Mount Carmel. The deputy watches Howell and the men turn and walk toward the door. He picks up his crossword again. Hopefully, this is the last he hears of Vernon Howell. But somehow, he doubts it. It's a few weeks later, just after midnight. Howell and eight of his followers are driving from their camp in Palestine to Mount Carmel. The November air is bitingly cold, and Howell has equipped his disciples with insulated coveralls designed for deer hunting. They're also armed with rifles and shotguns. The Davidians never had an arsenal until now. Howell's been around guns since childhood, but he's never pointed one at another human, and he hopes he doesn't have to tonight. Still, getting these photos for the sheriff's office is the best chance he has to reclaim Mount Carmel. And George being George, Howell has to be prepared. They park the van just outside of Mount Carmel and get out. Howell takes the lead. He clutches his rifle and stays low in the brush. Up ahead, he can see the dim outline of the church in the moonlight. The coffin should be just inside the front door. Howell drops into a ditch at the edge of the churchyard. The others join him. None of them have done anything like this before, and you can see the fear on their faces. He gives what he hopes is a reassuring smile. Howell feels a fierce determination coming over him. Now that he's returned to Mount Carmel, he's ready to risk anything to get it back. He sends one of his followers to sneak into the church with a camera. Howell and the others will provide cover in case he gets caught. Howell holds his breath as his follower scurries across the moonlit yard and ducks into the church. The man is only inside for a minute when he suddenly comes running back with bad news. The coffin isn't in the church like they'd hoped. Howell gathers the men around him. He tells them he has a new plan. They're going to have to go from one building to the next until they find the body. And that's what they do. After searching several abandoned homes, Howell finds himself staring at a familiar, worn-down structure. It's Lois Roden's old house. Howell swallows hard. He's almost certain her son is living inside. Howell motions to two of his followers. They should sneak across the yard. Suddenly, he hears dogs start to howl inside the house. Within seconds, George Roden comes charging out of the front door, his Uzi in his hands. Howell's followers hit the dirt behind a concrete slab, and George begins spraying bullets over their heads. Howell breaks cover and levels his rifle. George sees him and ducks behind a gnarled pine tree. Howell then fires, round after round, into the tree trunk, hoping to keep George pinned down. That's when he hears the sirens. He sees the flashing lights of three sheriff's cruisers racing toward him. The deputies get out with their guns drawn and shout at everyone to drop their weapons. George drops his submachine gun, and Howell sits down his rifle, puts his hands over his head. A deputy forces Howell into handcuffs, telling him they're taking him in for attempted murder. Howell barks at them and demands to know whether they're going to arrest George. Not for defending his own property, the deputy tells him. Howell asks, what about the body George desecrated? The deputy just laughs and shakes his head. Howell looks at the terrified faces of his followers being forced into patrol cars. He feels more anger than fear. Christ faced the ultimate persecution, but he won in the end. And so will Howell. He is the new Messiah, and this night proves that his flock will do anything for him, even if it means facing arrest or death. From Wondery, this is episode one of seven of Waco for American Scandal. On the next episode, Howell and his followers go on trial, and a new enemy emerges, one who's intent on bringing Howell down. If you'd like to learn more about Waco, we recommend the books The Ashes of Waco by Dick J. Revis and Memories of the Branch Davidians by Bonnie Haldeman. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. 
American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Sound designed by Derek Barrons. This episode is written by Michael Canyon Meyer, edited by Christina Malsberger, produced by Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. 